Would you pray with me? I just feel burdened to pray for uh, the things that are going on in this country and in the world. So would you pray with me? Don't just listen, but pray with me. Dear Lord, as we see the things happening in Ukraine, Lord, we see an evil yes. against uh, innocent people, Lord, and none of us are innocent before you, Lord God, but these people didn't threaten anyone. And we see evil and hatred in the world, Lord, and we just pray for the conversion, Lord, of those who rule in Russia. We pray for a conversion, for a for a sweeping revival in Russia. So they <coughs> turn their hearts toward you, Lord God, yes, in an amazing, miraculous yes. way. We pray for those poor people in Ukraine, Lord, that you would uh, that you would just uh, that you would just somehow, Lord, come to their aid, Lord God, both with your both with your love and your spirit, and with also guiding people like Samaritan's Purse and others that are helping them, Lord. We also lift up this country, Lord, and we also pray the same thing. We pray, Lord, that, you, that, that a revival will take place in Washington, D.C., of all places, the, the seat of, of evil in this country, Lord God. But the people that we see, with people that we see evil on their faces and in their eyes, Lord God, they just need you, Lord. They just need you, the same as we all did. So we pray for that revival to come to Washington, D.C., to come up to all of those who are in high places in this country, Lord, to change things around the way the country is going. It's on a collision course with you, Lord, but we just trust as we ask and believe in faith and, and ask it in Jesus' name that you, Lord, will have your way in this country instead of the evil ones, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. They said this morning, I was listening to Fox News a little bit. And one, outside one of the cities over there, they found a mass grave. 300 people were thrown in. And uh, evidently the Russians executed them. But uh, uh, my, my, uh, that's what I'm across. They're, they're just shooting people on the streets. Just shooting them in places. This guy died, and uh, he went, he just found himself in a burst of flames, and he was at the gates of hell, looking a little confused, and uh, the devil looked at his, at his paperwork, and he was a little confused. He said, he, he was unable to find this, any data, or a file on this guy why he was there. And the old man says, this can't be right. I've been a good man my whole life. And the devil nodded and said, most people have said this when they arrive at hell. Well, you can start with how you died and we'll figure it out. So the old man sighed. He said, well, I was uh, minding my grandchildren and enjoying a fun day. Um, I don't get to grandchildren that often because my eyesight is starting to fade. I don't see real well. We we're having the most wonderful time, and that's when everything went crazy. Out of nowhere, I spotted the largest and most grotesque mouse I've ever seen moving toward us. It was absolutely enormous. And that's when it moved straight toward the grandchildren first, limbs outstretched. You don't know where mice have been. What if it, what if, what if it had bitten one of them? Can you imagine if they got rabies on my watch? So what did you do, the devil whispered. And the old man continued. He says, you don't, you don't get how big this mouse was. Radiation it must have been. Too many cell phones these days, that's what caused it to be that big. I did the only thing I could. I grabbed my stick, my walking stick, and I cracked it over the head. Now, my eyesight isn't that good anymore, but I whacked it good. The kids started screaming at this point. You know how they get when they, 
when you have to kill an animal. But I needed to keep going. You see, with mice, you know, you, you got to make sure they're dead. Otherwise, they'll be back with others. So I kept whacking it and whacking it and beating on it until I was sure it was dead. So you killed it, the devil asked. And uh, the old man nodded. I did. The thing was really plain dead. The kids had lost their minds at this point. Tears everywhere, a crowd gathered as well, screaming at the sight. It was at this point that the exertion caught up with me. I felt my heart give way. I must have suffered a heart attack. The next thing I know, I'm here. Well, the devil said, concerned, that doesn't seem to add up. Let me give heaven a call, and we'll try to see what's going on here. So the devil pulled up a phone right out of the air, you know, and he dialed a number. And he's talking to Jesus. He said, I got one of yours here. This story checks out. It must have been a mix-up. So the devil nodded as a voice on the phone spoke back to him. And he gave the old man a silent celebratory thumbs up as the voice continued. The devil covered the phone speaker with his hand and turned to the man. He said, you're all good. They just want to know where you were when you died. And the old man said, well, that's easy. I was at Disneyland. <laughs> Killed Mickey, I guess. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, 11 to 14, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are un not under the law, but under grace. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, as we have a, an opportunity to get into your word this morning, we ask that you would bless these morsels to us, Lord, from your word, and that you would guide and direct these morsels to where you want them to go, and they would have the effect, a powerful effect, uh, that you want it to have, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Paul was writing to believers. He was writing to the, the church in Rome at that time, and he's admonishing themselves not to slip into sin. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin. And he's saying to them, sin, sin shall no longer be your master. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. They were people who had experienced salvation. Salvation requires yielding. You have to yield. You have to give into something for salvation. The Holy Spirit woos, impresses, pleads with the sinner. Can you remember? Can you remember? I sure can. And that, and, and that, that salvation is needed. It, it, can, it comes with conviction that you are a sinner in need of salvation. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that anyone can come under conviction. The Holy Spirit does that work. God is a gentle and does not force his blessings on anyone. The heart of the unrepentant is the battleground that Paul was referring to. Because even though we repent, we're still tempted. The enemy wants everyone to share his fate in the lake of fire. God's desire is that all should come to repentance. God's desire is that all of us would be saved. When we come to Christ as Lord and Savior, we turn around from going our own way. We turn around. We yield to the pleading of the Spirit. We yield to God. We repent. We give up being stubborn about going our own way. It's about yielding. We leave the old way of darkness. We emerge into God's holy light. We place ourselves into His ownership. 
Romans 6, 22 and 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, see, we put ourselves into his ownership. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that only happens when we yield to God instead of going our own way. We turn around from the way we were going, and we go the way of God. We go the way of the Word. Now that we are saved, we have to stay that way. We also have work to do. God expects us, expects us to carry the gospel and bring more people in. He expects us to be fruitful. Living for God requires daily yielding to Him. There's a road sign, a triangular sign that you see on the road sometimes. And it instructs us to yield. Yielding means give way. It means, it means you don't have to come to a complete stop right there, but you have to yield if there's other cars coming. We don't like to give way. We don't like it. It seems like surrender. We don't like yielding to other people. We're impatient at our intersection. The idea of being in a subservient position doesn't sit well with us. Yielding is not something that we prefer to do, but it's necessary. The trouble is that we struggle to stay in holiness. We struggle to stay yielded. Being human in nature, we have a weakness. We have a sin nature. Adam and Eve had it. We still have it. We're tempted to sin. The temptation doesn't go away when you become a believer. The enemy encourages us to be in rebellion against subservience. The enemy encourages us to rebel against yielding, in other words. Subservience is yielding, and yielding to God is absolutely necessary. Without holiness, the Bible says, no one will see God. You can't be holy without being yielded. I'll say it again. I left a place for an amen right there. Amen. <laughs> you can't be holy without being yielded. Consider Solomon. These two guys, <coughs> a, a father and a son, totally different in the way that they, that they uh, reacted with God. Solomon began his reign on the good on the good. Uh, of God. He, God blessed him with riches. And God blessed him with wisdom. He was the one who built the temple in Jerusalem. He had tremendous amount of abundance that God blessed him with because um, he asked God for wisdom to govern the people. And God was impressed with that so God gave him all this abundance. But in 1 Kings chapter 9, the first nine verses, I'm going to read all nine of them. It says, when Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea that you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple, which you have built, putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my, uh, my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David. Your father, when I said you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. And then in verse 6 he said, But if your descendants turn away from me, and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. 
all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this people? People will answer because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their ancestors out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. And that, of course, did happen when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Solomon started out as God's man. He started out his reign as a yielded person. He didn't stay that way. And here's what happened. 1 Kings 11, starting with verse number 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign wives, foreign women, besides Pharaoh's daughter. So he, was, so he had Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He was not yielded at this point. He succumbed to his own lusting. Verse 3, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. 700 wives. If he talked to one of them a day, it would take two years to get around to all of them. They wouldn't even remember their names. Imagine if one of his court attendants came and said, hey, hey Saul, uh, you know, one of your wives wants to see you. Which one? I can't remember her name, but she's the one with the dark hair and, uh, and, and dark eyes and uh, big feet. <laughs> well, that would be all of them. <laughs> they all, they, they were all, 700 of them. What's the matter with this guy? So, he followed, um, he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and that was the goddess, by the way, of Jezebel. And I think she, because she was a priestess, uh, she was a princess of, Sidon, of Sidon, and I think she was a priestess uh, to that uh, Ashtoreth goddess. And Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites, whom they worshipped by, by uh, putting their infant children in a fire and, and child sacrifice, infant sacrifice. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had, had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, both of which were worshipped by infant sacrifice. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. He was not yielded. We have to be yielded. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is uh, your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. In the end, Solomon was not yielded, even though he had started out that way. He didn't stay yielded. His blessings went to his head. He was unrepentant. We probably won't see Solomon in heaven. It's not for me to judge, but that's what it seems like according to this. His father, King David, by contrast, he knew how to get back into God's favor. David was a sinner, like the rest of us. He had his weaknesses. He knew when he was wrong. He knew when he sinned. His indiscretion with Bathsheba was sinful. His yielding slipped. He wasn't yielded at this point. 
yielded to his own desire, the same as his son did. It resulted in two deaths, the death of Bathsheba's husband, which, which was a friend of David, who's one of the inner 30 uh, of his soldiers, and the death of the child that she became you know, with child with. But he knew that he was wrong, unlike Solomon. He knew he was wrong. He knew when he sinned. This indiscretion was sinful. And when Nathan the prophet came to him, he said, you are that man. You are the man. 2 Samuel 12, 15 and 17, after Nathan, Nathan not Nathan, Nathan, Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent three, and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. Now picture that yielding. Here's the king, and he's laying on the ground, won't eat anything, because he knows he has sinned. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. He's a repenter. He knows he's been wrong. And he's laying there on the ground. In Psalm 51, it records his thoughts of repentance from this event where it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Pleading, crying out for mercy, that's yielding. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He knows he can't clean himself. He knows he can't rid himself of evil. He's asking God to do it for him. He's yielding his life to God. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And this is the this is one of the most important parts. Verse 10, created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a, a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David, at this point, was yielded. He knew how to repent. He knew how to yield before God. His son Solomon had no idea. He just went on in his own power. In his own power. So what should we yield to God. Everything. You cannot compartmentalize your life after salvation. You can't say, well, Lord, I'm, I'm giving you my life, but I'm going to, you know, I, I want to take care of this myself over here. Or I don't look at my, you know, maybe, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not going to tithe, you know, maybe I'm not going to do this or that, maybe I'm not going to witness, maybe I'm not going to be, you know, uh, prepare myself to be a soul winner. But we should yield everything in our life to God. He now owns us. We can't compartmentalize. It all belongs to him. All of it. Jesus paid the price for our eternity, for our lives, and our very soul. We belong to him. Not only part, but every part. Our loving devotion, our church, our finances, our behaviors, our attitudes, our actions, all have to be brought into compliance, yielding to God's will. Amen. Thank you. It was a weak one. But... Mm -hmm. 
see Michael, I have this little plaque that says, can I get an amen? They make me beg for amens in here. So that's what, that's what this plaque is. Jesus showed the way when he said, not my will but thine to the Father in the garden. He showed the way of yielding. If we decide something saying, well, I think this or I think that, we may not be yielded. We might be depending on our own personal actions and attitudes. Why should God be, re be impressed with what I think? Unless it coincides with his word. Why should he be impressed with my attitude? He's not impressed. God's will is expressed in his word. My opinion doesn't matter unless it complies with God's will. Amen. <laughs> the expressed will of God. It's expressed in his word. My opinion doesn't matter unless it complies with God. Choosing options without praying, without consulting the word, isn't yielding. It's not. When we were in business, we weren't open on Sundays. We had our family in church. There were times when people wanted us to go photograph this or that on Sunday. No, I'm not doing that. It's Sunday. Matter of fact, Senator, what was his name? Hmm? Jubilee? No, no, not Jubilee. Oh, you know who it is. Uh, I wish I could remember. His father was the transportation guy in Pennsylvania. <laughs> you know who it is? Schuster. Yeah, Senator Schuster. Bud Schuster. He called me up. Because I had photographed him before. And he called me up and he wanted me to take a picture of his family. It had to be on a Sunday morning in a certain place. And I wouldn't do it. I said, I'll be in church. Call somebody else. I'm not doing it. I have to be in church. He said, well, I go to church too. I said, well, good. <laughs> but he had to have it done. I, I wouldn't do it. Because I'm going to yield to God, not to Senator Schuster. choose a church based on whether they feel comfortable or whether they like, they like the music or whether the people dress up or whether the people dress down. In a yielded life, you would choose a church that God wants you in so that you can accomplish things for God in that church. It may be that God wants you to be in a church where you are uncomfortable. Your comfort doesn't matter. Yielding puts your comfort aside. It's the job of the pastor to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Sometimes the pastor has to bring a word that people are too comfortable and they just sit. And sometimes, it, sometimes the pastor needs to shake things up a little bit. But people do that. They choose a church, well, I'm not, I'm not comfortable pastor's too old, the pastor's too young, the pastor's too fast, the pastor's too small, the pastor's wife can't play the piano, this or that, or the other thing. And they, they choose based on their own ideas, their own attitudes, their own desires, instead of, Lord, what should I do here? What should I do? Show me, Lord. That's yielding. That's just one part of yielding. But these three points right here are from a minister named Steve Nielsen, he's a blogger from Minnesota, and I didn't, I didn't break the entire thing down here, but number one in how to be yielded is understand his lordship. He writes, I think the first thing that needs to happen in order to know how to yield to God is to gain an understanding that God is God. He's our creator. He owns everything, including you and he rules over everything including you he is lord of all whether we like it or not or 
whether we believe it or not. Thus, he requires us to surrender to him as Lord, just as all of nature does. And if we don't, we're guilty of sin and rebellion. And I will add that we're not yielded. And if you're not yielded, you can't be holy. And if you're not holy, you won't see God. Second point that he has here is understand the conflict within me. The moment I ask Christ into my life, to be the Lord of my life, I died to sin and was resurrected with Christ. That's Romans 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 2 to 5. When I died to sin, what that means is that I died to the reign and rule of sin in my life because Christ began reigning and ruling in me. It also means that my old sinful nature, my old way of doing things, or my old character died. My self-rule died. Now I have God's rule. When I was resurrected with Christ, God gave me a new life and a new nature. The new life and nature that I have is the very life and nature of Christ. It is a nature that wants to please God all the time. And likewise, has as its goal to destroy the sinful desires that still dwell in my flesh. And I will add, that's the age-old battle. That's, that struggle is always there. Now, since Christ reigns in me, the sin that resides in my body has no real power. This is in Galatians chapter 1. That is, it cannot in itself control me and make me a slave. God, however, has given me free choice, and so I can choose to yield either to the sinful desires in my flesh and become its slave or to obey God and the new nature and become a slave of righteousness. Hence, there are two forces at war in me, the old desires of the flesh that are always trying to get me to sin and the new Christ-like nature, which in contrast works to usher me into a life of righteousness. Since I have the Holy Spirit in me, I have the power to choose which path I will yield to. His point number three is this, understand how to conquer my sinful desires. The conquering of sinful desires begin with our reckoning. Romans 6.11 says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And, and, and I will add, we are, we are to know and think upon the fact that sin doesn't rule over us anymore unless we allow it to. Christ does. Amen. Thank you. So we're to reckon, that is to know and think about the fact that we have a new nature and that we have power over our sinful desires power to choose righteousness, we must pray and keep in fellowship because we can't do it alone. We need help from God and other believers. Yeah. That's why we have a church. Yielding to someone, even to God, is difficult. We don't like to yield because it's giving up. And we have our sinful flesh that is always telling us to give in to no one except our own desires. But with God's help in understanding, it's easier to yield to Him and to be holy. Yielding to someone, even to God, is difficult because we have our flesh is telling us to give in to no one except us, except our own desires. We all struggle with yielding sometime. We have an enemy that doesn't want us to be yielded to God's will. It's an enemy. We're the battlefield. We have the Holy Spirit and the enemy. We're in the middle. As a matter of fact, the struggle to be yielded to God is the most important of all of our struggles in life. 
John struggled in the hospital for 16 days with COVID. We struggle with all kinds of things. When you get older, you have aches and pains in places you didn't know were there before. Struggles. But the most important struggle is the one to stay yielded to God. Because it has eternal implications. Eternal. We have to keep our attitudes in God's, in yielding to God. Our thoughts are, you can't just say, well, I think it ought to be this way. We have to make sure that, that we're saying that because God impresses us to say that. Because we can think it ought to be this way, and maybe that's not what God wants us to think or to do. Amen? Yeah. So this is about yielding, about giving up our own actions and attitudes and attitudes and and wishes and will in placing it in God's hands that's what yielding is without yielding you can't be holy without holiness you're not going to see God amen amen so that's I mean I mean that's a message to the world but we all struggle with that because we're, our hearts are battleground we all struggle with with the with yielding but if we practice it and learn how to do it, it becomes easier. And I, I mean, how can, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can live a victorious life if you don't, if you don't have a word every day. I read about maybe 20 minutes. I read a one-year Bible. It has an Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm and Proverbs. Every day, at the, end of the, and at the end of the year, you read the whole Bible. And I'm going through that for the 28th time. And that's my power for the day. Then God brings to mind things during the day. Do you, do you remember reading this? You know, it comes into my mind. There isn't much that comes into my mind. <laughs> I can't remember ordinary things, but God puts the thoughts in me. Remember these words? You know? And uh, those come to you when you need to decide something, not based on your own wills and wishes and attitudes, but based on what God wants you to do. Well, we were going to do a closing song, but um, it's already past noon, and uh, the Baptists are probably already at the restaurant. <laughs> so I'm going to conclude. Would you stand with me? We'll do, our, we'll do that song next week. I always want to do a closing song, but I talk too long or too much or something like that. So would you bow your heads still with thank you this morning. It's been awesome to be in your presence here. And as we go, we'll take your presence with us, Lord. We, we brought you here you, because you're in each one of us, Lord. We brought you. We know you're here. And we gathered two or three or more. And we trust that the things we prayed about and prayed for according to your wishes and will be, will be accomplished, Lord. And uh, we pray that this word, uh, that was a little bit of a hard one to preach, Lord. We pray that this word will, this word will um, result in, in the fruit that you want us to bear. And as each precious believer here goes our own way today, Lord, we just pray that you'll keep us all safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, my friends.